It's not every day you get somebody coming back from the dead. It was one of the most audacious frauds anyone's ever heard of. There was never a funeral because there was never a body. There has to be more to it. No, I just pushed it out the sea. I thought it would relieve myself of the financial burden. The coroner declared him missing, presumed dead. That was when the money started coming and, you know, checks were dropping through the letterbox. He knew the only way to actually be able to live his life as a free man again would be to go overseas. The Darwins lived a bizarre double life. His wife, Anne, was in on the deception. She was smiling next to her husband, who she claimed was dead. They just smiled for the photograph. Bingo, the game's up. They both faced multiple charges of fraud. He was vain, he was full of himself, and he thought he was cleverer than everybody else. I worked out the details and then presented them to her. And of course, she didn't want to go along with it at first. The world revolves around John Darwin a real narcissist. There's this crazy story about this man who's come back from the dead. My name's David Lee, I'm a British journalist. I covered the case of the infamous canoe man John Darwin who faked his death. There was a mad scramble to get the truth behind the story and I was the one who, who got to her first. To those who knew them, the Darwins were a well-heeled couple who lived in this imposing property in Seton Carew. You know, the very blustery northeast of England. It's a small town and people seem to know each other. It is a very close knit community. They owned a dozen other buy to let properties, including the house next door, which they rented out as bedsits. John Darwin was Anne's first boyfriend. He was very persistent, he kept asking her out, and eventually they got married and they had two sons. Without doubt, this is an unusual case. However, there will be people out there who will know exactly where he has been, where he has been living, and what he has been doing. My name's Tony Hutchinson, and uh, I led the investigation once John Darwin magically reappeared. It was a huge case as far as the media was concerned. It attracted uh, global media interest. I was getting telephone calls and emails from people I knew in Australia, America. Everybody was talking about it. All that anybody was talking about was the guy who gone off in his red canoe and disappeared at sea. Despite a huge air and sea search off the North Yorkshire coast, his body was never found. But both family and police were puzzled. There was a huge air and sea rescue operation that went on for like probably about a day and a half. Once there was a, an inquest and the coroner declared him missing, presumed dead, that was when the money started coming and checks were dropping through the letterbox and then it jumps forward to five years when he walked into a London police station. I got a phone call on the Sunday morning just to say he'd reappeared and he was suffering from amnesia. But not for one minute did I believe the amnesia story. Police are now trying to trace Mr Darwin's wife Anne, who's left the seaside flat they once shared and is thought to be living abroad. My appeal today would be for anybody who has any information whereby we can piece together what has happened over these last five years. The British tabloids have always been massively competitive. Everybody wanted the story. You know, in those days, it was just go and get the story. It doesn't matter what it costs and don't fail. Journalists went to the house they used to live in, it's Seton Crew, and they spoke to the new owner. And he said that I opened a letter by mistake and he said there was an address in Panama City. I was actually the first British journalist on the ground in Panama. I got the address, I managed to talk my way into the complex. I was just hammering on the front door. I'd been there, I don't know, about 40 minutes and I was just knocking and knocking and knocking. And unbelievably, this little voice came back, what do you want? And she was obviously very nervous. I said, why are you still here? Your husband's just come back from the dead. I thought you'd be back in England by now. And then I got a, a message from one of the newspapers. You're not going to believe this, but we've just been presented with a picture of John and Anne in Panama 18 months ago, so she's lying through her teeth. She was stood there smiling next to her husband, who she claimed was dead. The picture obviously spoke volumes. It showed that she had been in on her husband's disappearance, and she'd lied to her sons that their own father was dead for five years. 
and the adrenaline really starts to pump them because you know you've got a massive story, you know, there's a big crime involved. I said, I've got something to show you and, and you're not going to like this. She looked at it and she went white, white as a ghost. She said to me, the boys are never going to forgive me. He was arrested before that photograph went in the newspaper and by the time the newspapers were on the streets, he was in a cell. And we didn't show him that until the third interview. So we allowed him to tell all these lies and then they hit him with the photograph. The realisation dawned on him that um, the game was up as far as he was concerned. I've had amnesia, blah de blah, blah de blah. They all went out the window when he was shown that photograph. So you did actually physically paddle out to sea? Yes. And where did you paddle to? South. North. I, I can't remember what he called it. North Gear or something like that. He paddled off in his red canoe, making sure several people had seen him. He rowed down the coast a little bit, came ashore and hid in the sand dunes, waiting for his wife. I had made my wife or basically told her that, you know, if we were doing things, then she had to agree, and she picked me up. He wasn't actually there. I had to sit and wait a while. Um, eventually, he came towards the car, and he said he had everything with him that he needed. What did you do with the canoe? Just let it push it back out to sea, or...? No, I just pushed it out to sea. I assume, then, the most difficult deception, apart from the official deceptions, must have been the boys. Yes. That is extremely painful. Always has been. Their home in Seton Carew, near Hartlepool, was the base for their deception but it was the sea they looked out on every day which provided a cover story. The whole of the UK was watching the daily developments and thinking this can't get any crazier and every day it got a little bit more crazy. Their father, who had just been formally declared dead, was in fact hiding upstairs. Mr Darwin had actually been living at home. He was living there right under everyone's noses. According to Anne Darwin, the fact that they owned both properties gave them freedom. When visitors, including their two sons, came to stay, John would move into the bedsit in number four, leaving just a thin partition separating a supposedly dead man from those who grieved him. He lived a pretty miserable existence between a, a grubby one-bedroom place next door and then hopping the passages late at night and, you know, spending time with his wife, but he couldn't really do anything or go anywhere. He knew the only way to actually be able to live his life as a free man again would be to go overseas. John and Anne Darwin intended to start a new life together here in Panama. They bought an apartment here and some land, but the plan somehow went wrong. He obtained a false identity and new passport. He assumed the identity of a dead baby. Yes, I don't think I would be able to pass off as a 21-year-old. John claimed he wanted to come back from the dead because he wanted to be reunited with his sons and he'd missed them. The truth is, I don't think he cared. About a month before John Darwin disappeared, the banks had been in touch, saying their mortgage and credit card repayments were set to double. But instead of selling off their assets and paying off their debts, John and Anne Darwin opted for the most extraordinary course of action. It wasn't actually the biggest um, financial crime in history, far from it. Uh, the payouts, I think, were about 250,000. John Darwin was never going to uh, declare himself bankrupt because that would be an admission of failure. And there's not a narcissist born who will admit failure. They both faced multiple charges of fraud. John did the most sensible thing he's ever done in his life and pleaded guilty. She pleaded not guilty using the very rarely used defense of marital coercion. I sat through the trial in Middlesbrough Crown Court and it was obvious from day one she was lying. For five years, she played the grieving widow with such aplomb that even her children believed their father was dead. The boys were called as prosecution witnesses. In court, they didn't look at their mother at all as they gave evidence. Because of the fact that she tried to get off, she got a longer sentence, six years and six months. They both served half the time, so John got out a few months before her. This was a woman who'd never even had a parking ticket before in her life. 
It was a mystery, it seemed destined never to be solved. One battered red canoe washed ashore. It would probably be true to say it was a, a crime of its time, but you, you possibly could still do it. I would never say never. John Darwin returned today to the beach where he disappeared nearly 10 years ago. I thought I was worth more dead than alive, and that was the truth. It was the most uh, astonishing story of my career. You keep thinking that's surely got to be the end of it, but you never know. It just never seems to die.